Hello and welcome to the Day Health Strategies podcast, Unlocking Accountable Care, the healthcare podcast where we talk everything value-based care with the top experts in the field. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unlocking Accountable Care. I am your host, Sarah bliss Matusik. I am a senior consultant with Day Health Strategies, and as usual, I'm sitting with Lizette Roman, a consultant with Day Health Strategies. So today we're going to talk to you about behavioral health, which is a pretty broad topic uh, and certainly a very important one in our country. There's lots in the news about things like the opioid epidemic and um, the you know the gun issues and mental health issues related to that have certainly been in the news. Um, uh, but in addition to that, a lot of the groups that we've worked with across the country have been really thinking about this in their population health strategies. How do we think about uh, looking at behavioral health as not a separate and siloed part of a human being, but as a part of the whole person? And how do we take care of their behavioral health needs and their medical needs together? So we're get, we have a really exciting uh, interview for you today with um, Dr. John Sargent, who is a psychiatry professor at Tufts Medical Center. And we'll get more into that in a second. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, behavioral health in general and thinking about taking care of those needs in a risk-based environment. Most of the levers that we see ACOs pulling are accountable care groups. We don't need to call them ACOs. We can call them risk-bearing provider organizations or others that are really trying to do whole person care. But most of the levers that we're seeing them pull are related to cost containment. Um, So rather than, for example, focusing on prices, they're really trying to rein in costs. Um, And they're investing in programs and resources to curb spending in different high-cost areas. So post-acute care is certainly one. Uh, Reducing avoidable utilization, meaning, you know, keeping people that don't need to be in the emergency department out of the emergency department, keeping people who don't need to be admitted to the hospital, they could get their needs met elsewhere, Um, reducing those sorts of visits. Um, And certainly behavioral health is one. So today we're going to focus on that. So what's needed to contain the total cost of care for patients? Uh, The idea is certainly to target members that we know are at risk for high future spending. And behavioral health has been one of those areas that historically hasn't been seen as modifiable or, you know, something that we can affect to drive down costs. Uh, The good news is that that's changed. So robust care management of members or patients or humans that have behavioral health issues when done right has actually demonstrated great results. And we've seen that those results follow a dose dependent pattern. So what we mean by that is that more intensive levels of care management yield better savings and actually improve the health of patients better. Um, And that's just as long as the level of care matches the specific needs of that patient. Right. And it's that, right? So matching the level of care to the specific care needs of the patient, that, that's where we're going to focus on today. How does an ACO make sure that the right level of behavioral health care is given to the right patient at the right time? Um, you, you know, from, from our experience, an ACO that effectively integrates behavioral health care into, you know, general medical care, general clinical health care, um, considers it part of primary care, they're going to get this right. And there's there's generally two components here. There's one, which you alluded to, Sarah, targeting high-cost members with appropriately intensive care management. And then there's two, the piece we're going to talk about today, making sure that the more, you know, kind of mild to moderate behavioral health issues that can be addressed in primary care are handled in primary care. Um, and, and what we mean by that is not requiring that the patient, you know, gets a referral, goes out to XYZ behavioral health provider. We don't want the patient to have to deal with more of the healthcare system. They should be able to get, um, you know, mild to moderate behavioral health issues covered when they're sitting with their PCP. 
Um, but you know, for this to happen, for behavioral health issues to be addressed in primary care, you really need to support your, C- your PCPs to do this work, right? So if you are an ACO, you have to provide your PCPs with you know what we kind of think of as three things. Um, a behavioral health specialist on the team that can do a lot of the kind of time uh, consuming work um, for the PCP, whether that's making referrals or having, um, you know, sessions with a patient when they're providing them some education about um, medications or uh, how to manage um, symptoms. Um, so that, that's number one, right? Your behavioral health uh, specialist. You also need a psychiatry consultant on the team, someone that the PCP can pick up the phone and call when they have questions about a diagnosis or they're thinking about changing medications, but they're really not 100% comfortable doing that without talking to a peer who has specific psychiatry expertise. So you've got your behavioral health specialist, your psychiatry consultant, PCPs need a third thing um, if this is really going to be a comprehensive program, and that's access to an addictions expert. So just like uh, providing your PCPs with a psychiatry expert consultant to call, you've got to get them an addictions expert consultant to call um, to, in order for them to um, you know, help patients who have issues with substance use. Great. Yes. And we're going to hear more in a moment about those three things that you just mentioned um, from Dr. John Sargent. As I said before, uh, he is a professor of psychiatry at Tufts Medical Center. Uh, He's also a psychiatry consultant to one of the Massachusetts ACOs, um, and he's our guest for today. Dr. Sargent is going to be digging into the history of behavioral health integration for our listeners um, and painting a picture of where we're at in that area today. Uh, So, Lizette, before we jump into that conversation that you had with Dr. Sargent, um, I just want to spend a minute on behavioral health integration, because it's one of those terms that we throw around a lot in the industry, Um, like no ACO is similar to another ACO, no behavioral health integration program is exactly like another. So what is behavioral health integration? In in our minds, and according to the way that we define it, it's really any healthcare delivery model in which behavioral health and medical providers work together. So this might mean physically working together in the same space, such as having social workers embedded in a primary care clinic. Um, but it could also mean some remote behavioral health clinician to primary care clinician um, consultation practices happening, as with the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Program, or MCPAP, as you'll hear Dr. Sargent talk about. Um, and that's just, you know, a clinician can call up a psychiatrist on the phone for a pediatric issue, for example. Um, and it might be some mix of both. So one sort of telephonic, one's, you know, could be really on site and there's everything in between as you'll see. Um, but regardless of the specifics of the model, the idea is really just to make sure that behavioral health issues are adequately addressed within the wider practice of high quality, high coordinated care, meaning that a person feels like all of their needs are being met and understood by all the different, um, practitioners that take care of them. Um, and typically this is, you know, housed or, or has been done at the primary care facility or office. So with that, let's jump into our interview with Dr. Sargent. So welcome to another episode of Unlocking Accountable Care. Uh, let me introduce uh, who I'm sitting with today, Dr. John Sargent. Um, Dr. Sargent is the Chief of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Tufts Medical Center and a professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Sargent is also a pediatric psychiatry consultant to one of the Massachusetts Medicaid Accountable Care Organizations, which is why we're sitting down with him today. Um, Dr. Sargent's clinical areas of focus include not just consultation psychiatry, but also family therapy, international adoption, and eating disorders, just to name a few. (laughs) Um, But today, again, he's here to talk to us about the role of consultation psychiatry in ACOs. Um, So Dr. Sargent, very pleased to talk to you today. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you very much. Um, So this this is a subject that has concerned me for probably greater than four decades. Um, When I was in medical school, uh, what compelled me the most were the challenges of children with chronic illness, uh, mental health challenges, and intellectual disabilities. Um, And the, the people who seemed to be 
doing the most to try to alleviate some of those challenges were pediatricians. And after medical school, I decided to practice, to train in pediatrics and actually practiced primary care pediatrics for a short while. It also was clear to me that um, we were not integrating attention to children's development, children's behavior, uh, and children's emotional well-being at the same time as we were attending to their physical well-being and advances were being made in pediatric care without attention to uh, the emotional well-being of children. And that led me to decide to train in psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry. And I've practiced child and adolescent psychiatry since then. Uh, It was my dream to integrate pediatric care and child mental health care in one uh, seamless effort where children would come to a clinic Uh, have their uh, well-child checkup, receive their immunizations, uh, but also have uh, the pediatric office be a place where they and their parents could talk about emotional, intellectual, and behavioral challenges that the child or family were facing. That was not true at that time, Um, and uh, it, it then became clear to me that what I needed to do was become an absolute expert at the interface between physical well-being and emotional and uh, behavioral well-being in children. Um, So I pursued that over the next several decades and also noticed that in the 1990s, there was increasing orientation towards an integration of health care and a recognition that we could help children be physically well, but if we didn't help them be emotionally well and developing successfully, we weren't helping them in any way satisfactorily. So uh, at that time, uh, I started thinking about how we could integrate behavioral health and uh, physical health. That was about two decades ago. Uh, And what has happened is that there's been increasing effort uh, in paying attention to those things and recognition that um, that the pediatric medical home is the place where children uh, are most well-known, most well-supervised, uh, and where families trust that the doctor and the other staff in the medical home uh, understand them, welcome them, and are oriented towards helping them. Uh, it also was clear to me that the behavioral health wor- workforce particularly child and adolescent psychiatry, but also other professionals, number one, uh, were completely inadequate to deal with the the frequency of child behavioral, emotional, and developmental problems. And second of all, were not located uh, in a place where they were interacting with and their work was integrated with with behavioral, with uh, pediatricians. And so you had... The, the mental health professionals in one place and the pediatric professionals in another place, uh, and they often didn't interact, uh, they didn't collaborate on care, and much of what they were trying to do actually involved people from the other sector uh, and were hoping that uh, they would know what they were doing, but, uh, but the care was entirely siloed. Um, as we noticed that, it also became clear that... Um, that actually emotional well-being affects physical well-being, and physical well-being affects emotional well-being. That should be obvious, but but in fact, it's uh, it's something that people were not necessarily taking advantage of when they were uh, designing treatment and providing care. Uh, And so uh, what, what one notices is that children perhaps with diabetes Uh, who are not taking good care of their diabetes, also feel incompetent, unhappy, uh, and their diabetes takes over their life, and they uh, feel very different from other children and are prone to anxiety and depression just because they're not able to take care of their diabetes. But on top of that, the depression then makes them less likely to take care of their diabetes, which makes the diabetes worse. And then that makes the emotional well-being worse in the sense of the child not being in the mainstream of healthy children uh, more real. And, uh, and so you end up in, in a big mess where 
things get worse, and then that makes other things worse. And often the family and the pediatrician and the behavioral health specialist all feel kind of at a loss, and the child is kind of left behind uh, and not developing well. So it seems like it would make sense to, number one, include pediatrics in behavioral health care because pediatricians know the children and families trust pediatricians. Number two, make sure that you're attending to behavioral health and physical health simultaneously because attending to both together adds synergistic opportunities. Um, The child uh, gains confidence by managing their diabetes, which then positively affects their mood and behavior, which then makes them more active socially, which then increases their motivation for taking care of their diabetes. And the whole circle goes the opposite way, where health breeds health, and where a chronic illness is only a small, small part of a child's life. Uh, and um, what one notices also is that behavioral health professionals uh, expect to be offering a short-term uh, uh, episode of care, two sessions, four sessions, ten sessions, perhaps even three to six months, but they're not following the child over uh, their their entire development. Uh, and so what happens is the child will go for behavioral health care, perhaps do better over a period of time, drop out of behavioral health care, and then the situation persists Uh, And then the child has another episode, and they have to not function well, not do well in school, not do well socially, and then go back to behavioral health care. But if you could imagine a pediatric medical home that monitors the child's development, that place would notice when the child was beginning to have a relapse and could get the child back into behavioral health care readily uh, and the behavioral health care could also be much smoother and perhaps more efficient if it was connected to a pediatrician and a pediatric medical home that was supporting the child's development and was trusted by the child and family. One of the problems that we have is uh, that there's always been stigma against uh, mental health problems in our society. And that has led people not to recognize mental health problems or not to seek care. So the workforce for child mental health is actually set up to deal with only about 20 to 30 percent of the people who actually need care, which means we have a huge workforce gap that's present in child psychiatry, it's present in psychology, um, and, uh, and it's present in social work and marriage and family therapy. And then what happens is that pediatricians, if they're charged with identifying problems, don't have anyone to refer to, and the family is sitting on a waiting list for three to six months, waiting for care while the problem either becomes increasingly uh, problematic or it gets denied and people go on about their business and then don't follow up with care when care is available. So one has to imagine how can we expand the workforce And how can we make access uh, uh, available to folks? And also, how can we make sure that the quality of care is excellent? And that's where the ACO, I think, comes in. Uh, Because the ACO supports the pediatric medical home. It supports behavioral health professionals in, in offices with pediatricians, nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, and uh, care managers, uh, and it supports the integration of the two forms of care, both in terms of supporting it financially, but also having an expectation that if care is provided in a more seamless way, and perhaps earlier in the course of a problem, with access being straightforward, uh, perhaps the degree of morbidity would be less, and that ultimately the degree, the cost of Uh, of care would be less because one would prevent emergency room visits and inpatient hospitalizations in a large portion of children who aren't receiving care uh, as as things are and uh, as things have been.
Very useful intro, not just for your professional journey, but also to set the stage for behavioral health integration. How has that evolved um, and where does the ACO fit in? And so where I'd like to go now um, is to hear a little bit more, you know, for our audience's sake, what does it mean to be a psychiatrist consultant to the ACO and how is that different from how you've traditionally practiced in the past? So um, psychiatrists do, or child psychiatrists do a range of things. They consult to schools. They consult to juvenile justice facilities. They consult to pediatric uh, hospitals and pediatric subspecialists. They practice privately in offices, and they work in academic medical centers. Uh, largely, though, they have not worked in pediatric offices, uh, and uh and often there's been a gulf between the pediatric specialists and pediatric primary care doctors and the child psychiatrists. But what the ACO does, which also McPap does here in Massachusetts, uh, is uh, it provides regular access for the pediatrician so that the pediatrician can call a child psychiatrist or talk with a child psychiatrist and uh, review things that they've seen in their office so that, that, number one, the assessment can be more straightforward, identification of problems more straightforward, uh, referral for treatment more effective, uh, and then ultimately the treatment can be more effective. So what I do as a child psychiatry consultant to pediatric offices in the ACO is I hear uh, the pediatrician's concerns about children. Uh, I help them figure out what's the best approach. About a third of child behavioral health problems can be managed by pediatricians alone, or uh, about a third really need subspecialty mental health care, but not very long and not uh, in a great amount of uh, detail. Uh, it can be done in the pediatric office in a relatively short term. And then about a third of uh, behavioral health concerns really require specialty care. And uh, and what the, the child psychiatry consultant does is provide a link for the pediatricians between the pediatric office and the community partners who provide uh, intensive in-home care for uh, children with serious emotional disturbance, uh, and in-office care, uh, which can be combined therapy and psychopharmacology for the children who need it. So uh, what I'm doing is, number one, supporting the pediatrician in their effort to uh, develop a good sense of each child's psychosocial behavioral and uh, emotional adaptation and development. Number two, identify the kids who need help. Number three, figure out the problems that they can deal with uh, in the office visit. Number four, help them with problems that can be dealt with in the office or in a neighboring uh, behavioral health office. Uh, and number five, get uh, consistent ongoing specialty care for the children with chronic difficulties, uh, which do comprise about 5 to 10 percent of, uh, of American children. Very, very helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I'm kind of tempted to, to go now to the question of, you know, we, we've heard what value you can provide. You know, what are three things you need in order to do that? You know, just because you're here for the ACO doesn't necessarily mean you can, you know, have that impact. Well, three things. Okay. Um, the number one thing is we need uh, pediatricians, pediatric nurse specialists, uh, pediatric offices to recognize that behavioral health is part of their work, um, that they need to uh, assess it. They need to identify kids with problems, hopefully early in the course. They need to effectively help the family understand what the problem is and what the treatment might entail. And they need to get the kid to treatment either in their office with a behavioral specialist in their office or uh, in a, spe a subspecialty or specialty behavioral health care facility or with professionals. So the number one thing is this is pediatric practice transformation. The American Academy of Pediatrics has long embraced this uh, and has a variety of resources for pediatricians. Uh, we here in Massachusetts have had a 10-year history of being involved with pediatricians through the MCPAP program. 
and educating pediatricians about their role in behavioral health. Uh, and now with the ACO, I think we have even more opportunity to approach more pediatricians. I don't think pediatricians can imagine that all they need to do is identify kids who are depressed and refer them out, and that's uh, their job. Uh, they have to imagine that they have to embrace these problems the same as they would embrace asthma, diabetes, uh, or uh, a genetic problem or a handicapping problem. Okay. Uh, the second thing is that I need, we need behavioral health specialists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, psychologists, and also child psychiatrists to know how to work in pediatric medical homes. Um, we're used to, we in mental health are used to being in a, a location with a variety of people who also do behavioral health. We're not used to uh, the pace or uh, focus of a medical office, and we have to learn how to do that so that we can uh, both survive and thrive there. And then the third thing is that I think the role of case manager has to be enhanced so that the case manager is seen as, uh, a, as a coordinator of the team, telling the doctor, the nurse, the behavioral health specialist, uh, and the family and the child what kinds of things need to be uh, done and what kinds of treatment needs to be offered in order to provide the best care possible. All right. So, Sarah, we just heard from Dr. Sargent um, all about behavioral health integration um, and especially how that's been such a really an important aspect of the Mass Health ACO that he consults for you know, as a psychiatrist. You know, what our listeners are probably thinking is behavioral health integration is nothing new. I mean, this, this is not news. And that's some of what Dr. Sargent um, was saying and recounting the history. Um, you know, Sarah, you, you did touch on this at the top of the episode, how you know, it's very common to talk about behavioral health integration as if it's a new kind of idea. Um, it's also really common to talk about behavioral health integration as if this is a behavioral health issue or initiative or concern. It's it's not. I, I love how Dr. Sargent put it. This is primary care transformation. Um, and, and it's not easy. We could have an entire episode dedicated to the challenges of, you know, actually integrating behavioral health care with primary care. I mean, you know, you could think of the most common obstacles that you hear talking to people trying to do this work. Um, there's stigma related to uh, treating certain mental health conditions or substance use disorders. Um, there's an under-recognized need for it, so it's hard to make that that business case. Um, there tend to be workforce gaps, right? So social work uh, shortages or um, shortages of psychiatrists who treat uh, children and everything in between. Um, there's there's access issues, and you know that's certainly related to the workforce gaps. Um, there's there's just a lot of challenges. Right, it's definitely not easy. Um, but I think the good news is that. ACO payment models or other risk-based arrangements that are being pushed more onto the provider side of the fence um, are really allowing for more flexibility for arrangements like curbside psychiatry consultations to be available because they're not reimbursed under a fee-for-service model, but if you move away from that, then it doesn't matter. You're just paying for whatever works best, and, and this does work best. So this shift from volume to value should theoretically help ACOs invest in more robust models for behavioral health integration, and we've already seen that in a number of places. There are groups across the country that are doing this very well, and often they are ones that are not in a very strict fee-for-service type model. And we know why this is important. We know that patients that have mental illnesses are among the highest need. They're the most costly patients in the system, by and large. Um, so what we're finding is that addressing mild to moderate behavioral health issues more adequately in the primary care setting with support um, can help prevent patients from rising in risk and cost. Uh, the, the systems and the groups really just need to come together and recognize the imperative and make that investment, which is a challenge. So um, that's all we had for today. We are looking forward to our next episode where we have um, a very exciting interview for you. Um, but for now, that is all for Unlocking Accountable Care, and we will talk to you soon.
If you are interested in learning more about accountable care or how organizations can succeed in today's healthcare system, please visit our website, www.dayhealthstrategies.com, check out our blog, follow us on Twitter, and join our mailing list. We regularly post content relevant to current healthcare issues and overcoming challenges in delivering value-based care. Unlocking Accountable Care is a production of Day Health Strategies. Direction and editing by Max Blumenthal. Additional support and research by Emily Eibel and Nico Lehman. Our producer is Rosemary Day. Special thanks to Purple Planet Music for the use of their songs.